Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm on the Rover mic, so I'm going to be wandering about a bit. Um, Roller Rigby is my um, compadre today in this presentation. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about some of the, um, the application of some new and um, helps press the button, doesn't it? Uh, some new and uh, exciting survey methodologies that look actually quite fortunately a couple of our earlier presenters have touched upon. Um, so I just before we start, I'd just like to bring everybody's attention back to a tiny bugbear that ruins my life on a, a, a weekly basis. Please like to remind everybody that we have within Network Rail a survey standard. We have rules about how we expect us all to play with the survey game across the industry. And within that standard, uh, I'm going to pointy finger here, so I must put that away. Uh, we have something and we require something called a project survey strategy. I've even put the page number in. <laughs> <laughs> and the project survey strategy is there to be created by the project manager with assistant from the CSM prior to the commencement of the work. So that, that covers, doesn't matter what stage of the work it is, it just covers the work that you may be doing from a geospatial point of view. And the CSM is a client survey manager and they shall be appointed, shall, oh my finger, I'm in the wrong way, here we go, shall be appointed by the DPE. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands for those of us in supply chain and projects as who are working on jobs that actually have a project survey strategy. I know it's probably going to be not as high as it should be. But this is just a reminder, if you're working on a project, regardless where you are in supply chain, if you don't have a survey strategy, you need to contact your DPE and ask them where it is. Because that will help to protect you and the rail industry and the people building the thing that we're going to ultimately build from a, uh, any erroneous or any um, misunderstandings regarding geospatial engineering. So, let's get to the fun stuff. Fun stuff. Quick video. So, Skemmersdale. Why Skemmersdale? Why not Skemmersdale? Um, in 1956, British Rail axed the existing rail connection to Skemmersdale, which, as we now all know, is a small town in the northwest of England. It's not too far from here, uh, but it doesn't have a direct rail connection. It's actually the largest town in England, and I suppose the largest town in the UK, that doesn't have a, a direct rail connection. Um, so, 56 BR chopped the connection. The government then in 61 created a new town and the current population is in excess of 40,000 people. So public transport, if you want to get a bus from Skem, takes you up to two hours to get to Liverpool, it takes you two hours more or less to get to Manchester. And for those of us that know, or from that part of the world as well, like myself, it takes an hour to get to Wigan. Not everybody wants to go to Wigan. Um, <laughs> I can say that I'm from Standish, I live near. Um, so what we have here, for the start of any particular survey work, we should be clear on what we have for a survey projection. So we're going to, with this particular project, uh, we will be having two project systems. We will be having the ordnance survey, uh, so we can tie into the local roads, and we will be running our railway snake grid projection. Uh, this again is a bit of information for, for anybody in the room who's coming to start a new, a new um, project. Uh, Manwig Chest 18 is a new projection we've had made. If you've got a job in the green, we can use this snake grid. Um, it's very easy, it's very handy, uh, it's just about information. Uh, where are we now? I'm going to talk to you a, a little bit about 
the types of technologies that we used on this particular project. Does this roll in right? It does, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. Um, so it was an early development stage of a job. This is a, an externally funded scheme for Network Rail. So it's actually a really, really good showcase to um, the local community, to the local council, uh, to our, um, uh, our sponsors and funders, um, exactly how can we do an undertake survey in the best possible way to provide the best information to the designer, to then provide the best information to the construction teams, to then provide the best information back to the route to maintain and manage this asset for the future. So what we did was, uh, 2018, we were actually reflying Scotland for our Georinum LiDAR um, aerial survey refresh for the network. So I borrowed the helicopter and a bit of gas, and we, we flew down from Scotland uh, and we mapped about a four and a half square kilometer area of the local environment. Um, one of the advantages of the, the new Fugro fly map system is that, as you can see, it gives us 20 to 30 millimeters worth of accuracy. Now, from li for previous versions of LiDAR, we used to work to 200 mil. We're now just to a couple of inches. So we've, we've got a game-changing um, way of interpreting the level of accuracy from these survey systems. Um, Nick was talking earlier about how do we get people to not be on site. Using these kinds of technologies, this is one of the ways that we can do it. So here's just a, a screenshot of what it looks like. For the non-geeky, or for the geeky survey people in the room, the fact in LIDAR we can pick out a curb line on the overbridge, this is just near Rainford Station, um, is pretty amazing. Uh, and then this is just the, the view in 3D, and then the high quality ortho photos that we get on the top. So for development work, this on its own is fantastic and brilliant. It's streets and streets ahead of what we've previously been using. Um, well, those up. Thanks, Steve. So, taking on from the aerial lidar, we completed the sort of the, the ground level surveys. Um, the, the, I think the first the first thing to mention is it's one survey grid. So, man with chest, as Steve mentioned earlier, covered the whole area, highway and rail. It was one GPS network um, from the start. It just helps with the consistencies, helps with um, the tie-ins, make sure there's no um, discontinuity between two surveys. Um, about 15 kilometres of P-way, 14 kilometres of highway, which meant it was large enough to start using sort of mobile capture technologies. Um, and a good opportunity for us to start comparing different mobile capture technologies. It's a good, it's a good case study, a good, a good database. Um, before going to the mobile data technologies, that's sort of all of the, sort of the cutting edge tech and really interesting stuff. Starting from the hole to the part, Start the survey control, primary, secondary, tertiary control, get that in, get that in the ground, get that coordinated. Man, man with chest is a snake, it's a projection, it's just a mathematical model. It's that, it's that nail in the ground that defines your survey grid. So for repeatability, when we're talking about BIM and you want um, data through the project life cycle, you need the nails in the ground before you start running ahead to do, do the survey and, and um, do the design. So fundamental, but often overlooked or, or rushed in the early stages, just do it to our grid, get the data out, we can start the design, and then you'll start piecing it and working back to, to snake grid. And it, it does get messy and it causes a headache. Um, and often it comes from a lack of understanding of scale factor, different projections, what the errors are. Um, it's not worth the hassle, trust me. Um, so the, the baseline again, P-Way survey. So we did, um, Normal network rail specification survey, Amber 1000 TMD, stop and go. That's the track alignment, that was the backbone. That, that, that was what we compared all of our mobile data capture techniques to. Um, we used the Leica Pegasus 2, our mobile mapper, for off-track detail only, but tied it down to the survey control, so it's all on the survey grid. It's survey grade data. Um, but for the purposes of this, we just used it for off-track soft detail, but it's very, very efficient. Um, we use an Amberg IMS 5000 system for structure gauging, again a, a standard approved bit of kit, but it does have other applications, um, which I'll touch on later, platform gauging with a Bantz platform gauge. So nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary there, but that's our, that's our staple survey, that's the backbone, that's what we compare everything to. Um, it gave us something reliable, something known, quantifiable. And I think that's, that's a sort of theme running through this, is 
when you're using the technology, there is no silver bullet. It's all fantastic. Aerial LiDAR, mobile LiDAR, train-based, trolley-based, it's all fantastic kits. But you need to have something that is truth, that's known, that's a datum that you can keep going back to just to make sure it's all in the right place and it's all as accurate as you think it is, because it can vary. So the systems we use, the highway survey, we used our Pegasus system on the uh, Amarok. We then took the Pegasus and put it onto an Aquarius, used it on track, um, had a, a Sunday possession, drove up and down, scanned 10 kilometers in, in one shift, um, a fraction of a shift actually, it's um, very efficient. The Amberg IMS 5000, next picture along. Um, we use that for gauging, but you do get a point cloud. I think the, the um, LU presentation earlier touched on some of the data. It's the same system. You can get topographic survey from it. You just need to know what the data is, what the accuracies are, and what you're looking at. And then we also teamed up with Fugro. They kindly brought their Ryla system out, mobilized from the Netherlands for our possession, stuck it on the front of the Aquarius. So it actually had uh, Pegasus and Ryla on the same Aquarius buzzing up and down. So it's under the same conditions. I'll say, before I go into the detail of the results, um, conditions were atrocious. It was chucking it down with rain. It was probably the worst possible conditions for scanning. Uh, hopefully a worst case scenario, which actually gives a bit more confidence in the results we did get. Um, this, is, this is just a, a snapshot of the data. So I think you saw the aerial LIDAR of this. Uh, this is the level of detail that we get from our data with the, the CAD model overlaying. So you've got your CAD vectors. The end deliverable is, is the same. It's a, it's a CAD vector model, it's gauging files, topo survey. Um, the point cloud is there, there's imagery, there's a whole lot of value in it. Um, part of the challenge is delivering that data, it's something Steve will touch on later. Um, but there's a huge amount of value in that data that can be extracted if you're confident in what the data is, which goes back to making sure you get survey control done right. You know what the survey grid is, you've got the nails on the ground, you've got your control signed off. All this lovely mobile data is tied to your ground control, then you can start using it. The danger is you can run out, you can get this data to two to five centimetre accuracy, or this data is sub 10 mil. And it's a big difference in what you use it for. So you just need to know where it's come from and what are you checking it against before you run ahead with it. Yeah, so coming back to uh, my old boss's mantra that we always try and maintain, survey once and use many times. Um, as Nick again touched on earlier, Normally what we've traditionally done with survey throughout the grip stages is that early on we'll have a look at some imagery, then we might send somebody out to site and do something, and then we'll run through a design process, we'll do some option, option selection, then we'll send another bunch of people out, normally from a different contractor, to go back to the same place, to acquire some more data, to a bit of detail, a bit more detail, and so on and so on. And then normally at the end of the system, or when we come to GRIP6 to build it, we'll have a different contract to come in to build it and construct whatever it is we're building, regardless of the asset, PUA, um, S&T, OLE, structures. We, we, mess, we mess the whole system up quite a lot. And we impart quite a lot of risk into the final delivery by having so many disparate pieces of information that we as Network Rail are generally providing to supply chain to undertake your design based your designs onto. And it's not, it's neither fair nor right. We shouldn't be doing that anymore in this, this modern world. Uh, and with the technology that we've got, part of the processes that we've undertaken here at Schemersdale were to actually assess the different types of survey technology against different benchmark, benchmarks. So where we've looked at the platform gauging, we've compared everything back to a solid bounce against that particular structure. So we can have confidence in what an actual survey system will deliver to us as the client and to supply chain to work from, so we, we can understand and, and manage those different variances in survey accuracy throughout the systems. Um, one big advantage of doing it in this particular manner is we survey something once at this stage, so we're currently project feasibility, sort of grip one and a half, grip two when we first started this. Um, we don't need to touch this data set till T minus 20 to construction of whatever it is we want to build. So that has a number of, a number of, a number of safety and product, uh, productivity and also cost benefits to everybody involved in the process. So we have fewer site survey shifts, Rollo will touch on that shortly. Um, we can provide digital familiarisation of a location and site to anybody going to that place before they get there. Now, I don't know how many people are here go out on track often or, or not often, 
and you will go to see a particular job. You won't have been there before. It's the middle of the night. It's raining. It's windy. You don't really know what's coming up against you. When we have full 3D BIM data sets for survey at the early stages, we can actually quite simply give access to whoever wants it, whether we go to VR, AR, um, or just on a computer screen to get people familiar with the site. So we can help to reduce and minimise risk of somebody falling down a hole or, or whichever, way, whichever thing we might run into. Another kicker is that if we look at the, as um, was mentioned earlier, the UK rail industry, we're, we're really in a massive boom at the moment, aren't we? For capital expenditure, for what we're getting for projects, HS2, us as no network rail, um, LUL, there's a lot of money sloshing around. So the design resource we have available to us is actually quite constrained. So we need to be starting to consider our design maturity at much earlier stages. Because how many times do we rework the same project when we've got new and updated versions of survey data when we can go out and capture it all quite easily? As, as Rollo mentioned just before, we surveyed 10 k's of track in a, in a shift, in one shift, in eight hours. So it ties in as well with use, the use of Ryler as we've used it on different projects as well. Um, we can improve design maturity and reduce the amount of design requirement for a given project, freeing up the design resource to work on more projects to get more work undertaken. And that in, in turn provides a, a, a cost saving to us as Network Rail. And this is back to Rollo. <coughs> So this is, this is a very sort of simplified version of quite a lot of data in the background. So there's a full 14 kilometres of track alignment. Uh, we had a track alignment from our Stop and Go Hamburg 1000 system, um, probably the accurate, accurate, most accurate system on the market, <coughs> or one of the most accurate systems on the market for getting a track alignment. So it's a really good base. Um, we then took the track alignment from the Pegasus system, which is orange data, the IMS 5000. So I mentioned before it can be used for gauging. It's the um, exact same system that was in the, the LU presentation earlier. Um, the inertial sensor does give you a track alignment position tied into control points at regular intervals. Um, we wanted to compare how, how good that track alignment is um, over different distances. And then we had the Riley system as well. And Riley did their band 1A survey methodology up and down four times. And we, we just compared it. So in plan, um, six mil was the worst deviate, was the sort of average. The, the, the bars are average and the lines are maximum deviation. I think what that shows you is height is the hardest thing to define, largely because it's chucking it down with rain and the top of the railhead is shiny when it's wet and it's very hard to scan that with a laser, so it's hard to define. But um, 12 mil is, is kind of around band 1A, band 1A accuracy anyway, so it was within expectations. Track geometry is, is kind of a, another level of accuracy, sort of. Um, I think five mil or better is what we saw. We did see a couple of spikes in the Pegasus data. Um, so the Pegasus performed better than we actually expected. It has, it has a laser that can pick the rails up. Both the Ryler and the Amberg system um, have, the Ryler has a, a dedicated laser for the railhead to get very, very dense data to get an accurate rail alignment. Amberg is contact, it has um, counting gauge sensors and it's kind of a contact measurement system. Whereas um, Pegasus is just using a, a rotating laser, which is also used for the topographic details. So for it to sort of perform um, as well as it did, it actually gave, gave us good, good confidence. We were quite pleased with that data. Platform gauging was the other thing we looked at. Um, and this, this, this data feeds into getting approval for platform gauging from laser-based measurements, which, if anyone's done platform gauging, it's, it's pretty tedious. 100 metres an hour of kind of X, Y, measure, measure, X, Y, measure, measure. The chances of writing a number down wrong are quite high. The chances of not finishing are quite high. You only get a measurement on the five metre changes that you actually measured on. You can't go back. Well, you can go back and measure more if you want, but you've got to go back. Um, so the benefits of the lasers, you can, you can measure the whole platform alignment, you can measure every millimetre if you wanted to. Um, I put a red box around the sort of plus minus 10 mil, because I believe the Bantz gauge is about that, I think it's 11 mil, um, it's in the gauging standard at. So 99% oh, oh, of our measurements were within plus minus 10 mil. We had a few outliers. When we dug into that data, the outliers, 
I think was actually an error in the BANTS data in that it's a coarser resolution. We actually found uh, in the laser data a bit more resolution and you found spikes of 10, 12, 15 mil here and there, which the BANTS hadn't picked up because it simply hadn't been measured at that location. Um, we also, when you compare, um, everything's compared back to the BANTS gauge as the datum, but if you compared laser data to laser data, we found it actually more consistent. So the BANTS is a good known entity, but it does have its limitations, and we actually get more consistency from a laser-based system. And just a, a max and average to say, so on average, sub-5 mil, uh, comparison back to the, the base, uh, maximum deviations up to 20 mil, but those we think are emissions from the BANTS data as opposed to errors as such. So we also did um, structure gauging SC0 files from all systems. I haven't done a graph because it didn't really show you very much, but um, we saw deviations of about 8 mil between all different systems, plus minus 8 mil was, was kind of the deviations we're seeing. And again, that's not solely an error in the laser measurements, it's in identifying the features. So on a rough, a rough brick wall, um, you'll see 8 to 10 mil of deviation just in the, in the brick surface. Um, what we're seeing in the laser data is those deviations, whereas more traditional methods might be coarser and not pick up the deviations. And just a quick one on, so this is more from a, me managing a survey company as part of the supply chain, what we invest into this equipment and why we do it. I think there's, there's, there's pretty clear benefits for efficiencies for network rail and the end client, but from us as a supply chain, boots on the ground, um, 70 to 90% reduction. We, we sort of settle on a roughly 80% less boots on the ground to get the same survey data deliverable. Um, we find the quality is better because uh, lasers can see in the dark. I need a head torch and you can only see what I can see. So we're far more confident in what we're delivering. Um, simple things like cable troughing, loose cables, load boxes, overhead wires you might not have seen in the dark. It's a lot easier to pick that out of a, day, of a laser data set than it is with your head torch looking up into the rain. Uh, we also use this for height stagger gauging as well. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very efficient tool um, and you get denser data. Um, our workforce has diversified. Um, these systems, there aren't many surveyors out there who are skilled in this system, so it's training from scratch, but they've got new skills. Um, one of the surveyors there, so that's uh, Dave, he's got 20 years experience on track, doesn't go on track anymore. He doesn't want to go on track anymore, and he doesn't have to, because he works in the office. He digitises, he trains the juniors in the office about what a survey should look like, what good looks like, measurement techniques. If Dave does go on, on track, it's to do training and mentoring. He's not running around with a head torch trying to do as much survey as you can in three and a half hours. Um, and so I suppose just a last point from us is investment. We've invested an awful lot in this kit. The, the Pegasus system is four to five hundred thousand pounds by the time you factor in training and IT and the background data storage. The Amberg IMS we invested in in December, that's a quarter of a million pounds. Um, we don't do it lightly. We do it because we have got less time on track. Uh, we do want to get good quality data. Um, I think the health and safety talk earlier was excellent. We don't want to be out there. Uh, red zone, I've done it. It's not the way. Um, line blocks should have protection. Um, our trolleys need to have extra protection because it's a trolley on the line. Um, it's all going that way. And, and this, is, this is part of it. So this exercise for us was convincing um, our clients that it is good. You can get what you need but you have to do it the right way. You have to get your control in, you have to follow the standards, and you have to communicate clearly what it is that's in the data and why it's good. Because one point cloud looks the same as another point cloud, but they can be very, very different in terms of accuracy and what you can use it for. And it's make sure we've got that, that transparency in the data. Can you communicate how accurate your data is? So there's redundancy, good survey principles in the background, redundancy, check measurements in there that we know are there, that we've checked, and we know this data is good, and we can prove it. Okay, so this again, just, I just wanted to come back and touch on how we can interpret and use some of this data. I've got a two minute warning, we're not going to go over today. Those of you seen, may have seen me talk in the past, I often do. Um, so the power of survey data is getting it into everybody's hands, be it on a mobile device, which we're now developing solutions to do so, be it streaming out on site, be it precise positioning and augmenting re augmented reality. Those technologies are not in the future, they're already here. We're just in the process of starting to implement those. Um, data storage. This is a quick one. It's not that big. 100 terabytes. It's not big anymore. We're not dealing with, I used to have a Commodore 60, I'm going to show my age now. I used to have a Commodore 64 computer when I was a kid. 
the data recorder, it was cool. Um, but then we had little bits of data. Now we're mapping the world in a 3D, uh, uh, in a 3D manner and we're colorizing that point cloud. We've got a lot of information in there. IT is catching up um, and currently Network Rail, we're upgrading to uh, different Microsoft Azure cloud servers, which will then help to disseminate the information out to the supply chain. And the, the main constraint that we're going to run into is actually not the power of your computer on your desk, it's going to be what is the size of the pipe into your office. Um, but we as Network Rail, we're currently, I think we're going to get a 10 terabyte pipe into Manchester in, in the, the very near future. Um, quick touch on the whole gauging approval process that we went through with this. I've been working with STE, time is up, stop. Um, last sentence. Uh, Ryla version 3 has been approved and accepted for upper, lower and um, platform gauging um, assessments and is being incorporated into ClearRoute. So there'll be no need for people to <coughs> fudge uh, what system they put into ClearRoute to get the answers that they do. I know you all do it, those of you that use ClearRoute. Everybody does it because we haven't gone through this process in the past. What we're currently doing, as you can see on the screen, Pegasus 2 will be going onto ClearRoute 2 in the near future, within the next four weeks. Um, Danberg IMS 5000 system, that is going, uh, that's in the process of being assessed, and all the Trimble suite of survey products, they're going into the system. So we're going to catch up <coughs> from the survey world how we're going to implement and use that information uh, in the future. I'm done. <laughs> Stop. <laughs>